Okay, so let's um, formally start this meeting and um, we will look forward to other people joining us as we progress during the afternoon. Um, my name is Debbie Carstens. I'm the chairperson of the Social Justice Committee for the Hunter Presbytery, and I'm the one that's made the mistake with the link. So I profusely apologize for um, leaving that six off in the original link that went out to everybody. It is our um, great pleasure to welcome to our meeting today, Nathan Tyson. Um, he's an Anawan and um, Gimaroy man, First Nations man, and also the manager of First People's Strategies and Engagement for the New South Wales ATC, ACT um, Synod of the Uniting Church in Australia. So it's wonderful to have you here um, with us, Nathan. We want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we are um, joining this meeting from and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and are thrilled to have um, Nathan here with us as a First Nations person to lead us through this uh, discussion this afternoon that we've entitled Voice, Treaty, Truth. Nathan, I'm very pleased to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, likewise, uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where uh, we all may be at the moment. I'm currently on um, Darug country, Mulgoa clan of the Darug nation in sort of near Penrith, a place called Lanay. Um, and I also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but we may have some other um, mob on the line. So if you're there, feel free to wave. Um, but I'd just like to acknowledge you as well. Um, and pay my respects to you. Um, I, I normally say this a little bit into my presentation, but I'll, I'll say it right up front um, because I do have other, other mob on the line with me, but um, Aboriginal people are not all the same. Uh, one, we come from many nations um, and I often say it's a bit like, it's a bit like Europe where you've got, you know, Germany and Poland and England and various other nations. So there might be some similarities. They might look a little bit similar, but in terms of culture and language and various other things, there's a lot of difference across, across that European continent. Same with our continent, with our nations, there was you know, some similarities, but also lots of differences. And I think like, like any group of people, uh, Aboriginal people have many and varied opinions about many, many things. So um, if for some reason I say something that uh, someone doesn't agree with, another uh, Aboriginal person or First Nations person online, um, please feel free in the chat to offer your perspective or opinion. Um, I, I completely respect that, um, you know, what I think may not be what necessarily you think, but um, I'll go into my bit, a little bit of my background. So hopefully what I say is generally on the money, but as I said, if for some reason you, you're not, you don't agree or you want to offer something else, please do that. I'm more than happy to have many, many views and perspectives in the, in the discussion later. So my background very quickly, um, I do work for the Synod of New South Wales, ACT, uh, manage your first people strategy and engagement. Prior to that, um, I've been there since about formally since about May, but I was there on, for 10 months on secondment prior to that. And prior to that, I worked with Uniting in the Aboriginal Strategy and Engagement Unit. But very brief history of my, my career and background is, um, so yeah, Anawan uh, Gomeroy person, pretty much my family's born and raised in Sydney. Uh, my family goes back to, um, so my, my, my nan's nan was a woman called Tina Brown and her, her mum, which we've only found out not too long ago, when I happened to get to Tinga and my uncle, my nan's brother got to Tinga. Um, her mother was Susan Munro and her mother was Queen Mary Ann Sullivan. So, um, which is Anawan country around Tinga Bandara uh, country. But as I said, my family's been in Sydney for about four generations. Um, my um, sort of education type background, um, I went to boarding school up in Lismore, St. John's College Lismore, which is a Catholic school. Um, quite a few Aboriginal people have been, been through that school. Um, then I went to university, went to University of New South Wales, did jurisprudence law, um, graduated, got a job with the New South Wales Ombudsman's Office as a, an Aboriginal complaints officer. Um, so that was dealing with complaints about public authorities uh, from Aboriginal people. Uh, I did a comment to the ICAC, worked on the Aboriginal Land Council inquiry a little bit, uh, did a comment to Aboriginal Affairs, New South Wales Aboriginal Affairs, and worked on the uh, Bring Them Home Report con community consultations. Um, ended up then with the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board for about four years where I ran the Aboriginal unit there. So investigating, conciliating complaints, um, leading the, the outreach team, so doing education. 
Uh, from there, I then went over to the Australian Securities and Investments Commission where I looked at sort of unconscionable conduct. So community engagement, unconscionable conduct, consumer protection type, type work. Uh, I ended up at NAB, uh, got headhunted and went over to the National Australia Bank and ran a um, community finance, um, financial literacy type program called Indigenous Money Mentors. Then uh, global financial crisis hit, wonderful thing. Um, and of course the bank it tends to get rid of its, its you know, community programs first. So I became unemployed and eventually ended up working for Miru Mitigar, which is an Aboriginal community organisation in Western Sydney. Um, ended up as the 2IC general manager there for probably was there for about four years and then ended up taking a job in Western Sydney Uni where I was the coordinator of the Baden Army Centre. So that looked after the support for all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students across the various campuses of Western Sydney Uni and did that for a few years and ended up at Uniting in a church engagement role working with the Uniting Aboriginal Islander Christian Congress and as you've heard, then did his comment to the Synod and ended up now at the Synod. So a fairly diverse and wide background, um, but pretty much all of my roles have involved working um, and engaging with Aboriginal people and communities. So I've done a lot of work in New South Wales. I've been up to the Torres, Strait, Torres Straits to Dwan and Saibai and Thursday Island, um, been over to the Pilbara, uh, Robin and places like that. Um, little bit of work down in Victoria, um, so yeah, so I've been around um, in my complaint handling days. I probably dealt with you know thousands. I can't remember how many complaints, but you know, in talking to Aboriginal people through that sort of process, I've I've heard it all, or maybe not at all, but you know, I've heard the worst of things um, and seen some really great outcomes as well. So heard lots of different opinions about lots of different things. So that's sort of what informs my um, what I will say today about the things that I will say. So that's, I think, my that's probably enough um, to start with. Hopefully, it's given a few more time to people time to join. Um, oh, in my time, I've also been um, I, at one point. I was the president of the New South Wales Aboriginal Lawyers and Law Students Association, which was fun. Did that for a couple of years. I've also been on a few executives of community organisations, you know, treasurer and vice president, and things like that. So I've done a bit of time in that community space as well. Um, Debbie, can you just do me a favour, if you can keep an eye on the chat, just in case there's any questions that pop up that are relevant, if you can yell them out to me as we go. And yes, I'm a Panthers supporter. Go Panthers. Woo. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to do that for you. And um, also, did you want to make, I, I will make you a co-host just so that there's no issues with um, sharing your screen, et cetera. Because cool, I'll do that. Oh, yeah, I'll share in a second. Yep. And so, so what, we'll, what I'll basically do is in a second, I'll share my screen. Um, I've got some slides. I find it's useful to do that, um, not so that you have to read them. So please don't feel like you need to read them, but it does help keep me on track and make sure I don't forget anything. And then towards the end, um, hopefully that will take maybe about half an hour for me to read through those. Um, and then we will open it up to discussion. So quite a free uh, discussion. Um, I always say like, consider it a safe space. You know, I don't, I, you know, as you, as I just said, I did 10 years of frontline complaint handling. So, um, you know, I'm not afraid of questions and I'm quite, you know, reasonable in terms of what people can ask. And yeah, you know, I will do my best to answer it. If I can't, I'll let you know. Um, I might be able to offer somewhere else that you could get advice from, or I might need to say, look, I'll find out and come back to you, which I can sometimes do. Um, but please feel free. If there is a question that you've had that's burning, that you've always wanted to ask, but you've been a bit afraid or you haven't known who to ask, feel free to ask. And I, I ask that everyone sort of just be respectful because, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I find in this work is that most people just, it's, they just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask questions, you're probably never going to know. So I would rather mm -hmm. people ask questions and, and learn and, you know, then be able to move on. And you know, then you can have another question to, to ponder at 2 a.m. in the morning, if you like me, when you wake up anyway. Nathan, I've got Nathan. Before you start, you're starting to look angelic. I don't know whether anyone else has got, but you've got a light source. I do directly I, behind you. I do. Which is a bit disconcerting. Yeah, that's a bit better. Yes. I'll that's try and better, stick yes. my I'll stick my big head in the way. 
That's uh, that's but you don't look like and you don't look angelic now. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no angel, I can assure you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. So I will now try and share my screen, which I have done this a few times. So hopefully I'll I'll know how to do it. Okay. And then can you still hear me, everybody? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Now so I'll start this off. I should be on the first screen. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to have a bit of a chat about the voice treaty truth stuff. I'll do a little bit of an introduction to that. And then I'll very briefly mention the walking together action plan, which is a church thing, but there's little bits that might be relevant. And then just quickly say some stuff about Aboriginal community engagement, because I, I suspect a lot of people might be interested in how that works and, and what they might do. And then we'll throw it open to questions. I'm on a Zoom meeting now, which is what my question was about. See you later. Okay. Well, there's my acknowledgement, but we don't need that. So very quickly, um, and this, the reason I'll talk about the covenant statement, the Uniting Church in Australia's covenant statement is it sort of, it sort of links into the truth telling stuff that I'll talk about later. And I just um, want to mention this in terms of an example for, you know, an example of what um, organizations and churches can do in terms of truth telling. So very quickly, this was produced in 1994 by the Uniting Church in Australia, and it was read out by the then president, um, Dr. Jill Tabbott. So I'll just read a couple of statements, both from the covenant statement and also from the preamble to the Uniting Church constitution, because um, they, they sort of set the scene a little bit in terms of the discussion. So this, this um, paragraph says, we recognize as was declared in the assembly's 1988 statement to the nation, that the Australian people and this church continue to benefit from the injustices done to your people, as in Aboriginal people, over the past two centuries. We believe it is right for the Uniting Church to make reparations to you for your land taken from your people and used by the churches, which became part of this church. Oops, I've got uh, it is our desire to work in solidarity with the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress for the advancement of God's kingdom of justice and righteousness in this land. And we do reaffirm the commitment made at the 1985 assembly to do so. Uh, 1985 was when the Uniting Aboriginal and the Christian Congress was set up. We want to bring discrimination to an end so that your people are no longer jailed in disproportionate numbers and so that equal ha housing, health, education and employment opportunities are available for your people as for ours. To that end, we commit ourselves to work with you towards national and state policy changes. We commit ourselves to build understanding between your people and ours in every locality and to build relationships which respect the right of your people to self-determination in the church and in the wider society. So that that's, I think that's all, yep. So that was from the covenant statement. So 1994, it was post bicentennial. There was a little bit of, um, discussion in the church around the bicentennial stuff but um so then in i'm pretty sure it was 2009 um yep the uniting church revised its constitution uh the, sorry the preamble to its constitution and it added this preamble and i'll just read a couple of bits from the, that preamble as well again just to set the scene in terms of what's happening around truth telling and moving forward so this uh, preamble includes some members of the Uniting Church has approached the First Peoples with good intentions, standing with them in the name of justice, considering their well-being, culture and language, as the Church has proclaimed the reconciling purpose of the triune God found in the good news about Jesus Christ. Many in Uniting Churches, however, shared the values and relationships of the emerging colonial society, including paternalism and racism towards First Peoples. They were complicit in the injustice that resulted in many of the First Peoples being dispossessed from their land, their language, their culture and spirituality, becoming strangers in their own land. The Uniting Churches were largely silent as the dominant culture of Australia constructed and propagated a distorted version of history that denied this land was occupied, utilised, cultivated and harvested by these First Peoples who had complex systems of trade and interrelationships. As a result of this denial, relationships were broken and, from the, and the very integrity of the gospel proclaimed by the churches was diminished. From the beginning of colonization, the first peoples challenged their dispossession and the denial of their proper place in this land. 
In time, this was taken up in the community, in the courts and in the parliaments, in the way history was recorded and told and in the Uniting Church in Australia. And then also in 2019, just as a, a last bit of church um, sort of history, um, in 2019, the UCA Assembly, which is the National Meeting of the Church, acknowledged uh, the sovereignty of Australia's First Peoples in this, in this wording. So they said, in light of the preamble to the Constitution of the Uniting Church, which defines sovereignty to be the way in which First Peoples understand themselves to be the traditional owners and custodians, and B, the statement of, from the heart's acknowledgement that sovereignty is a spiritual notion reflecting the ancestral tie between the land and First Peoples, to affirm that the First Peoples of Australia, the Aboriginal and Islander peoples are sovereign peoples in this land. So that was a, a statement uh, from the church acknowledging sovereignty of First Peoples. Uh, and I always like to sort of add that, um, you know, the church isn't parliament, it can't make laws, it can't change laws. So um, in a lot of ways, that acknowledgement of, of sovereignty was, was symbolic because, you know, unfortunately it's not, doesn't really have a legal impact, but um, I think from a church point of view, it was a really great thing that, that was done. So, and in terms of generally that um, church position, uh, and this, this sort of stuff could apply to other organisations as well. So, uh, you yeah, know, potentially look at this church history as, you know, the history of some other major organisations or possibly the way other organisations could start to move forward. So, but what we see with the Uniting Church is that there's a clear acknowledgement of the church's role in past injustices that have impacted First Peoples. There's courage that the Uniting Church takes in, in this truth telling and acknowledging the wrongs. There's a commitment by the church to acknowledge sovereignty and the right to self-determination. And there's also a commitment to walk together in the future, like from now to address past wrongs and to seek justice for First Peoples. So I think that's the, oh, what am I doing? Yeah. So, yeah, so that was sort of just more of a lead in to set the scene a little bit in terms of, I find some of those statements from the church quite powerful, and it also means I don't have to make it up. So those statements have been thought through by a lot of people and approved by the church. So I'm not saying anything that hasn't been already said, um, but I find it really useful truth telling. So then we get to the, the statement from the heart. Hopefully most people are aware of the statement from the heart. Um, I'll preface this discussion by saying that I am well aware that there is um, some controversy around the statement from the heart. As I mentioned earlier, Aboriginal people have different views on a lot of things. There were some groups um, that were felt disenfranchised and, and disconnected or not involved or not included in the process of the statement from the heart. And I acknowledge that. Um, but in, I think, given that the statement from the heart is out there and there, you know, there's some learning resources and things around it, I, I find it useful to talk about the content. So the voice, treaty, truth, the principle, those three principles I think are quite useful as discussion starters to talk about. I think in talking about them, which I will in a minute, I think what there is a need for is, is a more uh, inclusive discussion at a nation based level with First Nations peoples, so that each First Nations group can be properly informed and have informed consent and under those principles of self-determination can make their own decisions about what they think about the voice or what they think about treaty and the way they express truth um, and want that truth expressed um, in, in wider society. So um, I think that's a helpful way because I think as much as we can say voice treaty truth in the statement from the heart, we're still a long way in terms of actually talking to First Nations peoples about what that means and how we put it into practice. So I'll use Voice Treaty Truth as a way to, to sort of just initiate some discussion around that. Um, in the church, um, the way this sort of came to the fore, the, the statement from the heart was that um, Reverend Dr. John Squires and Reverend Amelia Co. Butler put a proposal to the 2019 Synod, which was um, endorsed by the Synod. And part of that proposal said, in recognising its commitment to covenanting and reconciliation, the Uniting Church in New South Wales and the ACT seeks to further its call towards a reconciled future between First and Second Peoples. This proposal offers a way for intentional and meaningful engagement with the statement from the heart. 
The proposal invites the church to consider the meaning and intent of the statement and its implications for Australia. Through public support of the statement, the church is saying that it has listened to what was said at Uluru and recognises that it represents a legitimate and salient voice from First Nations people who have proposed a preferred way to a fairer and just society. So, yeah, that was that was the the church's. So the church, Uniting Church, is engaged in well, the Synod of New South Wales and the ACT, and more broadly, is sort of engaging with this document and also starting to think about how the church can respond to voice treaty truth. So now we're going to get into probably it's it's generally my opinion about these things, um, voice treaty and truth. Um, as a as a black fella and my perspective, um, fortunately I, I do have a legal background, so I can be a little a little bit legalistic at times, but hopefully not too much. But anyway, we'll see how we go. So the statement from the heart uh, calls for the establishment of a First Nations voice in, enshrined in the Australian constitution. It's important that First Peoples are able to be effectively, uh, to effectively contribute their perspectives into the development of legislation that will impact our people and communities. One of the challenges we have is that, you know, at 3% of the population roughly, um, in most places, we're not able to affect the outcome of elections. Um, not without a lot of help anyway, which is where we need allies. Um, and I was saying to some the other day, you know, the, the 1967 referendum probably wouldn't have got over the line, but for the union movement and our allies in the union movement and others. So we need non-Aboriginal people to walk with us and help support us and, and stand in solidarity with us. So, in terms of the voice, I believe the only way this is possible is to have a mechanism enshrined in the constitution that gives First Peoples a genuine and effective capacity to influence the content of draft legislation or proposed legislative amendments that are put before the parliament. What this may look like is still to be determined. However, what is certain is that First Peoples will not be satisfied with a mechanism that is tokenistic or symbolic. So, as I said earlier, there's still a lot of discussion to be had around what that mechanism looks like, but it has to be substantial. Um, you know, having, having something, my view, having something on the side as a group that can have an opinion that's taken or left, won't probably make the change that this is about. Um, you know, First Peoples need to have a voice into the development and approval um, of, of legislation that's going to impact us. And in fact, um, I've got something a slide in a minute that I'll talk to about that. So in terms of treaty, um, voice treaty, uh, the statement from the heart calls for the establishment of a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making, making between governments and First Nations, i.e. the establishment of treaties, essentially. As a result of the unlawful use of the doctrine of terra nullius, the British did not form treaties with Australia's first people as they did in New Zealand and in other countries around the world. Australia is the only Commonwealth country that does not have a treaty with its first peoples, um, which is pretty shameful, really. I mean, everyone else can do it. I don't see why Australia can't do it. Um, as the British used the doctrine of terra nullius uh, for claiming, uh, not sure, I, not sure, but anyway, the British used the doctrine of terra nullius, which means a land belonging to no one. Now, I've thought about this stuff a lot, um, even from my university days, um, thinking about treaty and doctrine of terra nullius. I did a bit of an essay on, on terra nullius at one point. And one of the interesting things to think about when you're thinking about, well, what would a treaty achieve? If we look at the New Zealand situation and the Treaty of Waitangi, which by all accounts, I've spoken to some people and they say, look, it wasn't a fantastic treaty at the end of the day, but, and there were different versions of it because it was in language. So there was, you know, a few, few, um, problems around, around the treaty generally. But I think the thing with a treaty legally is that in order to form a treaty, you have to recognise what's there. You have to recognise the people, the law, um, and the, the custom that you're, you're then going to override with the new legal document. So, um, so in New Zealand, that effectively happened. So, so the, the First Peoples were recognised, their laws were recognised, the fact that they were there was recognised, and then the treaty came and was overlaid over the top of it to set the relationship. In Australia, because we didn't have a treaty, because it, there was this fiction, and it was described in the Mabo decision as a, a legal fiction, um, the application of terra nullius, the doctrine of terra nullius to Australia, the, um, 
you know, the British were basically able to turn and go, well, we'll just pretend there's no one here. So that way we don't have, because the thing that a lot of people don't know is that the, the, um, the British, you know, Cook and Co were actually under royal instruction that if they came across native peoples, they were to form a treaty with them. So this was the royal you know, direction that they were meant to follow. Whereas through using terra nullius and saying, well, there's no one actually here, they could circumvent that direction and just claim it, sort of claim it. So, which is what they did. So unfortunately, you know, today when you hear about Aboriginal peoples saying, you know, sovereignty never ceded, you know, that, that's a fact. That's, that's not just a, a sort of a catch cry or a war cry or a, a protest cry, that, that's actual fact. Because we, we've never had the opportunity to be asked to cede our sovereignty. So um, yeah, we haven't actually ceded sovereignty. So unfortunately in Australia, whereas in New Zealand, for example, you see that there's dual language, um, there's dual languages in schools. There's a dual language national anthem. I love the New Zealand national anthem, by the way. Um, you know, there's this this sort of you know, I'm I'm not saying there's no no dramas in New Zealand because there certainly was some dramas, you know, after colonisation there with theft of land and things like that. But if you look at the situation today, it's slightly different in terms of the acknowledgement of of culture and stuff and and first peoples in New Zealand. In Australia, we've still got our nation saying you're still not recognising our sovereignty and we've never ceded it and we'd love to have a treaty. We really need a treaty because there's some stuff we've got to get sorted out. You know, there's healing that needs to be done. You know, we, Aboriginal people are pretty realistic. We know we can't go back and change the past. It's just, you know, we don't have a time machine, but certainly there are structures and systems and things that are in place that have been built off the back of um, a lot of injustice that's occurred. And we need we need that restorative justice piece to, to start talking about, well, how do we fix that in practice? Um, what sort of things can we do to, to heal that and to, to make reparations for what has happened? Um, all right, I'll keep going because I'll, I'll just keep talking. So this is, this is what I was talking about earlier about, um, about legislation. Um, so, the, so Australia is actually a signatory to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is UN DRIP. Um, so the Australian government's endorsed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, but it hasn't really taken steps to implement it into law, policy or practice. It hasn't really negotiated with Indigenous peoples on a national action plan, for example, to implement it. And um, there hasn't really been any, an auditing of existing laws, policies and practice to comply with the United Nations Declarations on the Right of Indigenous People. And if you look at that, uh, that uh, United Nations Declaration is quite interesting. And just one of the things I pulled out of it when I was having a look at it was this Article 19. And remember, Australia's um, endorsed it, um, but hasn't sort of really put it in place, but they've endorsed it. So this is what Article 19 says. States shall consult, so states by being Australia, Australia being one of the states that's endorsed it, shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. Now, as a lawyer, that for me is a really powerful statement because what it sort of says to me is that things like the NT intervention and you know, cashless welfare cards and some of those sort of bits of legislation that have had massive impacts on our peoples um, should have been actually done in, 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 you know, with our free prior and informed consent um, and at least some discussion before they were implemented. And unfortunately, there sort of wasn't any. So these are, the, these are some of the, the um, international type, uh, international law type instruments that um, are out there um, and that really should influence that um, that treaty component of voice treaty truth in the statement from the heart. I think if we're going to talk about treaty, um, we need to look comparatively with other countries to see what's happened, what's worked, what's good. You know, there's, there's templates and information out there that can guide Australia in, in how to do this. Like Australia is not making this up for the first time. It's been done many, many times and um, is, is possible. So I won't talk too much. Um, Makarata, um, so truth, the statement from the heart says, Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations 
and truth telling about our history. So that's directly from a statement from the heart. So truth telling, again, this is me talking again, truth telling will involve listening to and recording first people's stories, experiences and perspectives and ensuring that Australian history reflects first people's experiences of colonisation, dispossession and resistance against genocidal practices. So truth telling will involve talking about things that many non-Indigenous Australians would prefer not to know. Um, and this is based on my experience of having lots of these discussions with people who haven't wanted to know. But the things that they probably don't want to really know are things about stories of oppression and prejudice towards First Peoples, stories of blatant racial discrimination, stories of children being forcibly removed from their families, of mothers grieving for decades, of children who never saw their parents again, stories of murders, massacres of First Peoples, including women and children. So truth, this truth telling will involve stories of human beings treating other human beings appallingly, like really badly, with an absence of empathy or compassion. Um, you know, some of the stories are just, they're almost sort of unfathom, unfathomable in terms of how people could do that to each other. So the truth will be hard to hear, but the reality is Australia has to face these truths and acknowledge the wrongdoing and injustice and find, find ways to make reparations or we won't be able to heal and move forward as a nation. Um, I know there are a lot of people that would probably think, oh, look, we, we just keep talking about this and I wish it would just go away. From a First Peoples perspective, it's not going to go away. Um, it, is, it is part of our you know, part of our history, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our, our, our every day. Um, and the impacts of colonisation, um, you know, in many ways, we're still being colonised, but those impacts are still impacting our people every single day, whether it's incarceration rates, deaths in custody, you know, stolen gens, removal of kids, like um, young people in, in detention, youth suicide rate, like there are, there are so many really serious ways that this stuff is impacting our people that it's not going to go away. We need to have the conversations. And look, I won't go into to most of this stuff because I think I'm sort of probably preaching to the converted in a lot of ways. I think most of the people online probably know a little bit about this history. Um, but I've got a couple of things. I think I've got some slides. Oh, look, one of the things I'll mention is I often tell people that they should watch the bringing them home video. You can, you can find it on YouTube um, or you can find it by the First Nations resources website that I put on the chat earlier. We've got a link to it there. It's about a half an hour video. But um, Sir Ronald Wilson, who was a, an ex-president of the Uniting Church, he was one of the, the key people in, uh, in that um, Bring Them Home uh, commission that looked at, at all the evidence. And this is a statement that he says in the middle of the video. He says, it was genocide. I didn't know it at the beginning of the inquiry, but since I have, no doubt it was genocide. One of the definitions of genocide is the fifth clause in the definition of the Genocide Convention, and it says, the removing of children from their communities with a view to extinguishing their culture. Now you've only got to say that to appreciate that it was genocide. So, and when I heard him say that, um, it was quite a powerful acknowledgement, like a quite a powerful truth telling. Um, for someone of, of Sir Ronald Wilson's stature and, and status in, in Australian society to make that, that statement. Uh, okay, this is just some statistics. Um, you know, I'll leave that up there for a second for people to have a look at. Um, I can't remember, they were probably the most recent-ish statistics I could find, um, but things like, you know, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal children are 97 times are more likely to be removed from their families. Um, you know, if you look at those numbers uh, in out-of-home care. Um, it's, so in 1997, there were 2,785 children in out-of-home care, Aboriginal children. In June, 2020, there were 23,344 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. So almost sort of 10 times, or maybe not quite 10 times, but nine times maybe um, what, the number of children out of home care were when the actual bring them home report was was issued. So yeah, so we've got a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of work to do in that space, in the out of home care space and the removal of children space still. 
Um, there are some wonderful groups like Grandmothers Against Removal and others who are doing lots of great advocacy work. So if you get a chance to support GMARS or Grandmothers Against Removal, please do. That's probably just a, a visual, a visual uh, image of the number of children in care. So you can see they're bringing them home report where the national apology was that it must never, never happen again. And then the line just keeps going up. So something's broken in that system and we need to, you know, all together collectively as an Australian society, um, have a look at what that is and how we fix that. Because generations of our kids who are our future um, are, are still being institutionalised and it's just, it's not, it's not good enough. Like, we, you know, if we're going to fix anything, we've got to fix this stuff for our kids. Okay. Now, I'm going to, oh, what I'll do is I'll just leave that there and just talk to this, but because I've got a couple of stills of it, but there's a really great article in the, in the Guardian. Um, I think it's called The Killing Times, The Massacres of Aboriginal People in Australia. Uh, it it's, has a, a, time, a timeline, like a, a map that over time, it shows all the places where, the, where massacres were. So this, for example, is part of uh, one of the images from, from it. This image, um, just so people are aware, this is, um, hang on, I've got my. So this is massacres of Aboriginal people. So um, between 1776, I think it is, and 1929. Um, and yeah, there were, there were, I knew there were a lot, but this is, these are the, the massacres that um, have been identified and, and confirmed to date. So there's probably some more that haven't been confirmed. Um, yeah, many, many. Um, and the, the colour range tells you the number of people involved that were killed. Um, and I apologise for talking about this stuff. Um, it's a bit hard, but it's important that we, we understand this. So the next slide. So if we have a look at all of those dots there um, and just think how, how tragic and awful that would have been. Then the next slide we get to is, if I can get there. So this is massacres of colonists by Aboriginal people, because often you hear a, a narrative from non-Aboriginal people of, oh, but you know, it went both ways. You know, Aboriginal people killed, you know, first uh, killed second peoples or killed non-Aboriginal people. Well, this is the documented massacres of colonists by Aboriginal people. Now, it's probably not just me, but there's a lot, 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 lot less colored bits on that map of Australia than there is, it was on the last one. So just as a little bit of a, let's, let's actually tell the truth about what happened um, in that space of frontier wars and, and massacres. And then the next one, next one's also really interesting, which is, so this is, I thought, look, you know, when I used to think about this, the frontier wars and massacres and things like, I, I sort of tended to think, and again, it's a narrative that's often, often put forward by non-Aboriginal sort of people is that oh, it was, the government just did that. It was the government's fault. You know, it wasn't us. It was government, you know, and the government was responsible. The government of 100 years ago was responsible. Well, these dots are massacres that were undertaken by settlers and stockmen and colonial civilians. So not the government, not the authorities, but actual individuals and groups of individuals. So as you'll see, there's quite a few of those. So just, just in terms of that truth telling, just to keep that as a bit of information that you know. So when people say, oh, yeah, it was just the government or it was just the police or it was just whoever, it actually wasn't. It was a quite a, a commonly almost accepted practice of, of colonial society to do these, these sorts of things, which is really, really tragic. I'm not saying everyone accepted it by any stretch. There were, I'm sure there were members of the non-Aboriginal community that were horrified by what happened, but unfortunately in practice, it still, it still happened. Okay, before I, the next little bit I was going to talk about was community engagement. I might just stop briefly to see if there's any questions about that stuff, or I can move on to the community engagement piece, which will take about five minutes and give people a chance to think about that, what I've just talked about. What, what, would, what do you think people would like, Debbie, or others? Yeah, I was going to say if other people would like to either put in the chat or, um, or, or take themselves off mute and ask a question at this point around those voice treaty truth th themes, you can do so. 
if there are no questions, we will move on to the the um the community engagement. And we'll have more time for questions later anyway. Absolutely. Nathan, can I ask a quick question? One of the things that seems to me to be different between here and New Zealand is that in New Zealand there is the Maori language. There's a, a sort of obvious group of people with whom to make a treaty, whereas in Australia we have First Nations peoples and many languages and many groups. Yep. Um, how does that must make it more difficult? Yeah, I'm not it's, suggesting yeah. it's a good excuse. I'm just no, saying. No, no, you're absolutely right. You, you're absolutely right, and that is one of the you know. There's a number of different things contextually between New Zealand and the Australian continent, and certainly, yeah, we've got you know, you know, hundreds of nations that that were here, you know, pre, well, still here, but certainly, you know, around when when the British arrived. So, you know, in terms of having like a dual language national anthem, you know, we we might have, you know, if we're going to do it really really properly, we we might have like three hundred versions, which in practice isn't is it's not practical to do that. So. There are certain things that were going to be challenging, but um, you know, I think I think we really need to think about it in terms of, you know, if you know, I don't think any, you know, Australia wouldn't go, for example, to um, to Ireland and say we're going to just negotiate with you to have a treaty with Ireland and the rest of Europe. Um, Australia would know quite well that it needs to go and actually talk to all of the other countries and include them in an agreement that they were going to make that affected them so it is just a reality that i think if if it's going to be done properly um it should involve at least as a minimum the opportunity for every australian nation of our of first peoples to have sort of input uh, and informed consent into some sort of process to come up with, I mean, if it's a national type treaty, I mean, my, my version of treaty, for example, is that we would have a national treaty that includes some, um, some items that are beneficial and generic and able to be implemented across all of the country, but then also have sort of sub treaties within that structure that enable agreement making with individual First Nations peoples based on their context and what they actually need in terms of addressing the past and reparations and things like that. So, you know, what, what people in urban areas or, or semi-urban areas need versus what remote people in remote places need might be very different things in terms of reparations and, and what they need for their people. So, um, you know, whereas for example, you might better say, well, across Australia, and I'm just, I'm not saying this is what will happen, but just as an example, all right, we're gonna have um, free university education available for all Aboriginal people as part of a way. We're going to remove income tax, um, income tax from all positions under 100, worth under $100,000 for Aboriginal peoples to encourage people to get into employment um, and to make that employment more yeah, beneficial for them um, in terms of them getting a little bit more pay for their, you know, for their work. So things like that, I think you could potentially do, and I'm not suggesting the government would do that by a long shot, but um, it's just examples of, hey, there are stuff you know, that you could probably do nationally um, that would have a really good impact um, across all, all First Nations people. But then it might be working with, you know, individual nations based on their context and geography and the issues that are impacting their communities to see what they may want particularly. And it could be infrastructure, it could be housing, it could be access to services, it could be um, compensation, it could be, you know, having all the unclaimed Crown land just given back to them. Um, yeah, so... So yes, it is a different context um, and it's quite complicated, but you know, 2021, we've got some lots of, lots of smart people in this country that are quite capable of doing it if the will is there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Doug, did you want to ask your question about the curriculum changes being attacked by politicians? Yes. Yes, thanks, Debbie. Nathan, you would know of the uh, um, national curriculum changes that are proposed. They're out in draft form. And uh, they involve some truth telling about history. And of course, no longer, no sooner do they appear than we've got the Federal Minister for Education attacking this uh, renewal of the black armband view of history. And just in the last couple of months, in speeches, particularly to organizations like the Institute for Public Affairs, mm. he's uh, raised strong opposition 
to changes to the curriculum that put uh, Australia's history in a bad light when he says there's so much to celebrate and why should we always tell the bad stories? Now, I was hoping that we might hear the voices of the churches coming out and saying, let's tell the truth in our history. And uh, so I'm hoping that somewhere in the Uniting Church, there might be some voices uh, telling Alan Tudge that he uh, doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, look, I, I'm involved in a group. Um, so the Uniting, Uniting Care Australia, which is sort of a national uh, body through, with the assembly has, uh, I think in 2019, they first gathered a, a group of Aboriginal people from from the Uniting Aboriginal and the Christian Congress, from the different uniting agencies, so the, the community services and advocacy uh, organisations of uniting the Uniting Church in all the states and territories, um, and representatives from synods, um, Aboriginal and First Peoples working for synods, for example. So I gathered that group together, um, and we just started thinking about what sort of advocacy do we want to do and how are we going to do it. Um, that group then got impacted by COVID because no one could travel and we couldn't meet. Um, we've only just got back together, but certainly the, one of the big things on the table is national advocacy and what our priorities for that national advocacy are. And um, so there's general support and agreement from the church at a national level, and I'm sure at state and territory levels to support First Peoples advocacy. Um, and I can, I can assure you, Next, next meeting we have, or in fact, probably before then, I can flag that with that group as saying, well, what is the church saying around the curriculum stuff? But in terms of that general sort of black armbands, yes, I, I, don't, I don't quite get it in that, like, you know, Aboriginal people love this country. Like we've loved it for 60 odd thousand years. Like it, it is the best country in the world, we reckon. Um, so, Certainly, it's not as though, you know, mo I think most Aboriginal people would certainly not disagree that Australia is a great place generally. But in saying that, you can't, you can't just completely whitewash stuff like, you know, the, the stuff that I just showed you on the map of Australia that happened. I mean, these, these yes. are ancestors and relatives that, that were killed and massacred, the, you know, dispossession. You know, we don't have generally... Um, generational wealth in our communities because that generational wealth is now in the hands of, you know, people who, you know, are now fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth generation non-Aboriginal people who whose ancestors were, were given huge tracts of land, you know, across the country um, as a gift, basically. Here you go. Um, so that's filtered down into this sort of, you know, some quite wealthy people these days, whereas our people are still struggling um, you know, uh, to, to make ends meet because we don't have that history. So I think, and, unless we talk, you know, I'm, I'm now I'm preaching the converted, but unless we unless we talk about that stuff and are honest about it, it's it's not going to go away. So people can people can you know politicians can say we, we we shouldn't talk about this. We should just talk about the good things. They can say that all all day every day. First peoples are still going to be talking about this stuff until it's fixed. And we yes. will be talking about this for another hundred years if it takes that long to get it fixed. Because if we don't get it fixed, you know, first peoples are still going to be living in disadvantage in a hundred years' time. You know, and we can't like that's not that's not acceptable. So, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad it's been taken up, and uh, there might be some action. Yeah, and certainly those things like the covenant statement and the preamble to the constitution. The Uniting Church in Australia certainly has been on the front foot um, relatively in terms of acknowledging that history. So um, there's still, a, there is still work to be done, obviously, like it's going to take time to find practical ways to actually do the stuff that we've acknowledged that needs to be done. Um, and that's what the Walking Together Action Plan um, is for the Synod of New South Wales. It's sort of a practical guide to what congregations, presbyteries and the Synod can do. So at a Synod level, things like procurement, looking where we get our goods and services from, trying to use and support Aboriginal businesses in terms of employment, employing more Aboriginal people through the Synod. Um, so those sorts of things. So, but yes, yeah. I get very frustrated as I'm sure many people do about people that just want to sort of move on. Um, it's, I said to someone the other day, this is a really simple example, but it's like, if, if someone came and just 
stole your just stole everything you own to like you, you got home today and all your stuff was just gone and no one could find it and you were left destitute homeless penniless just out on the street and then you know in 20 or 30 years time you happen to find out who had all your stuff and they still had it all now would you be thinking oh look it happened decades ago like i'll just forget about that or would you think hang on i want all my stuff back most people most reasonable normal people would go hey that was wrong what that person i want all my stuff back please and you would expect the justice system to help you get your stuff back you would expect australian legal system to help you that's all that's all aboriginal people and first peoples are asking is that this this stuff happened to us and we just want justice we just want our stuff back maybe maybe if it's not there anymore we can't get it back but whatever is still there we'd like it back please and what's not there maybe we can get a bit of compo for it you know um yeah anyway i'll stop talking now that's okay, Nathan. Thank it's you. a great that's a great illustration. We've got a question from Jen coming. Thank you. Jen? It's not so, not so much a question, but it's it's simply um, probably to draw people's attention to the author and historian Henry Reynolds. And I think he addresses this really big ambiguity that exists in society because in in our current country, we have this term lest we forget. And it's always pushed and pushed and pushed that we will never forget all the wars and the conflicts that all of our, our soldiers have served overseas in. Not all of them being highly successful either, but we're prompted not to forget all these things, yet there is a, a request to somehow forget all of our Indigenous history. So uh, I think society probably needs to have a little bit of a rethink. If we can believe in one, then why not the other? Um, and I, I would highly recommend Henry Reynolds' latest book about truth telling, because I think it exposes a lot of that to people that would come as a surprise. It's sort of very informative, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I just saw a comment pop up around about um, the Jewish people and, and the Holocaust stuff. Um, and I, I spoke to, um, what's Barrel? I went down to Barrel United Church and, and they invited me down to have a chat to them. And at one point, in the middle of a service so i'm not quite sure how i ended up there but i ended up talking about how like in in germany and other places in europe it's actually an offense to deny the holocaust like you can get locked up you know you can get in really serious trouble for publicly denying the holocaust and it's not just in germany some other european countries have implemented stuff as well whereas in australia we still today have people on social media and you know on the radio and other places making these comments sort of, you know, dismissing stuff as, ah, oh, that's, you know, it didn't happen. It was, you know, um, you know, being really, really flippant and dismissive about what is in fact quite a, you know, very horrendous and tragic um, reality that occurred in this country. So, you know, I'm not suggesting we necessarily need legislation that puts people in jail that won't acknowledge it. But I think as a country, we need to at least acknowledge the fact that this stuff did happen and do it respectfully and appropriately and with a view to moving forward and healing and being able to, you know, sort of fix those things. Um, Cause yeah, just denying stuff, just, yeah. What's that saying? You know, in order to fix a problem, you need to acknowledge it exists. Uh, we need to acknowledge it exists and then we can move forward, you know, anyway. Yep. Thank you very much, Nathan. Was there any other questions at this stage or we invite Nathan to continue with the community engagement piece that he was going to talk about? Just a quick question. Yes, please. Um, yeah, just wondering about the potential for, I mean, there's a lot of people getting into ancestry nowadays. It's a couple of hundred uh, years since, uh, you know, coming up from my ancestors coming to Australia and uh, they went to the Wimmera and I, I read the ter tragic story of the Wimmera boy, a fellow who was, uh, his parents were killed and then they took him to England to, you know, expose him as a great example of Christian the civilization things um but I, I wondered whether there's there's any effort to trace that history and thus the amount of property that was around in terms of that um stealing of property and and helping people to to see well here is the ongoing benefit that your family has got is there any sort of mathematical or models that have helped uh, that that process look i 
there, there probably would be a way, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but there probably would be a very complex sort of algorithm that you could do somehow to do it, or you could do it on a case by case basis. But I don't, like, I don't, I think for the most part, Aboriginal peoples are, um, like, we're pretty, we're pretty reasonable, like, we're not unreasonable. And, you know, it, as much as it would be lovely if some of these, you know, if large property owners or, you know, there has been cases, for example, where, where people who own large amounts of property towards the end of their lives have actually gifted it back to the local traditional owners. Um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's it's amazing and it's, it's beautiful and it's it's fantastic. What we do have, though, is huge amounts of unused Crown land around Australia. For example, in New South Wales, part of the reason the Aboriginal Land Council, New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council was set up, was to claim unused Crown lands. So the Aboriginal Land Rights Act was about setting up a body that would claim Aboriginal land rights. Um, so, and, you know, fairly recently, there was something like 30,000, um, don't quote me on the numbers, but there was huge amounts of land claims, maybe 30,000 odd land claims that were still unprocessed. So, and it seemed to be that, you know, you know, the legislation that the Aboriginal Land Rights Act was meant to be beneficial legislation. It was meant to help. It was meant to address these issues in helping Aboriginal people identify and claim unused Crown land so that it could be handed back. The system has actually seemed to operate in a way that actually finds every possible reason or excuse to stall or stymie or thwart that happening. And that's what you know, there's this huge amount of land claims that just haven't been processed over, and some of them have been around for decades. So, you know, it's those types of things that look, if we're going to be serious about this, like let's actually fix this system and get that unused crown land that, you know, is sitting there back to Aboriginal people so it can be used for economic development and, and various other things. Um, yeah, it's not about, someone asked me at, at another forum, you know, they, they raised land rights and asked about their sort of their backyard. And I said, no, 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 like, you know, we're not, no Aboriginal people are coming for anyone's backyard. It's about that unused Crown land. It's about the land that the Crown owns that's sort of sitting there um, that is in, was originally taken as part of dispossession that it would be really great to hand back to Aboriginal people. Thank you. And Gary have got a hand up. Sorry, um, sorry, yes, Christian and Gary, please go ahead with your question. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I was really impressed with the, uh, the amount of legal background there is uh, coming from the United Nations and the, the Treaty for Indigenous Peoples, that, is, that Australia has signed that treaty and uh, done nothing about it. Uh, I'm also aware that you can have huge community movements um, and them not change the government's attitude whatsoever, whether it's the Iraq war or whatever it may be, climate change. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm wondering if if one way to go forward would, would, would be the, the legal route. And uh, one way about that would be maybe uh, congregations in cities engaging with law faculties Around, around the United Nations Treaty, Australia's signet, being a signatory of it and then not doing anything about it. Hmm. And see if there's not some pressure that can be built up that way. It's a way of getting congregations involved with people with considerable clout, if not now, eventually. Hmm. Um, because we've talked about this stuff on, for 100 years, or since 1938 in particular, but... Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was. Is that William, I, William Cooper? You're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I know that date. Yeah. yeah. So uh, um, anyway, that was just an idea that came to my mind as you talked about the United Nations Convention. Yeah. Look, I mean, my hope is that um, I, I I never personally got into sort of that that international cons international law constitutional law space. I sort of went into to rights and disagreement and you know consumer protection type space, but. My hope is that, you know, we, we do these days have some good um, constitutional lawyers, people like Professor Megan Davis at New South Wales Uni. Um, you know, we've got, um, you know, QCs, you know, we've got Tony McAvoy 
um, who's a QC. We've got some really, really smart Aboriginal lawyers. And I think also obviously some really smart non-Aboriginal lawyers. Um, I, I still do keep hoping that one day there will be some sort of international law approach to addressing the treaty issue. And I don't know if and when that will happen. And I'm sure people, they, there could be people working on it as we speak, um, and hopefully there are. But um, yeah, and that may be the only way it will happen because as you say, like governments don't seem to be really particularly moving forward with anything uh, substantive. So um, it might take that push, but you know, it's the sad thing about the, you know, and it's not just, um, you know, it's not just Aboriginal issues or First Peoples issues. You know, we see the same sort of government approach to international stuff, United Nations stuff around climate change and around refugee things. And you know, they sort of go, yeah, yeah, that sounds all great, but we'll just do our thing, thanks. So um, one of the things I do say normally to people when they say, but what can we do? Um, it's like, it might seem obvious, but think about who you vote for. Um, I won't tell you who to vote for, but think about who you vote for. Like what's their track record in terms of First Peoples affairs? What have they done today? Have they done anything today? What do they say they're gonna to do tomorrow and next year when if you vote them back in? Um, you know, again, political promises pre-election don't really seem to amount for anything these days, but at least if they're putting it on paper saying they will support a treaty, for example, or they will support X, Y, and Z, that is going to be beneficial for, you know, that, that sort of reconciliation type process. You know, maybe have a think about throwing your vote their way. Um, if, I've, if, I've got, I've yeah, got sure. my hand up, and I will. Um, I put my hand up to help facilitate a group of people in this forum this afternoon to go and talk to the law faculty at Newcastle. Okay. About about United Nations, and um, and I'm just wondering who would come with me, if to arrange to arrange that and just to see where it went because I think we've just got to try a whole bunch of things. Well, you would know that better than I do. Yeah. Doug's got his hand up, but I don't know if, I don't know if it's a hand up to ask a question or to say he's coming with you to Newcastle Uni. <laughs> You're on I'll mute, I'll join Doug. you, Gary. Yeah, I'll join you, Gary. And okay. if, you, if you can do it by Zoom, even though we're out, but if you can do it by Zoom, I'll join you too. Um, Okay. Okay, we might, I might just quickly duck into the engagement stuff and it'll take me hopefully about five minutes and then we can come back to some questions because I'd, I'd hate to finish without getting the chance to, to just do this engagement piece. Importantly, thank you. Okay, so when it comes to community engagement and this is a very broad overview, I suppose. So, but. I come across a lot of people who, who they want to engage with their local Aboriginal community. They want to meet some people. They want to do some stuff. They want to help. They've got great big hearts and they really, really want to just do some stuff. But these are, the, these are some questions that I think are worth considering before you actually start engaging. So the first one is, why do I want to undertake the engagement? So what are you hoping to achieve? Because you sort of, you know, you really need to have a bit of a, a purpose like a why are you doing it so that if if you know if you go somewhere and and someone from the community says like what are you doing what do you want you've got an answer to that you can say to the community my reason for wanting to stand alongside you to work with you to to be in solidarity with you is to do this now that might be i just really want to to learn from you about what your aspirations are as a community and what your needs are to see how I can best help you to do whatever you might want to do. And that's a pretty good one. Um, but, you know, the, on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, if you turn up and they go, well, what, are you, what are you here for? And you go, I don't know, I just thought I'd come down and see if I could help. Um, but very in a very naive way, um, that probably won't get you a lot of traction. So you really need to think about what, what your purpose is. And then the second one, the second question is, what am I willing to contribute to help facilitate the engagement? So what do you have to offer to this community or this particular organisation that will make it worthwhile for them to engage with you? Um, the reality for a lot of our elders and community leaders is that they are flat out. They are dealing with crisis. They're dealing with grief and loss. They're dealing with 
you know, all of those issues that I mentioned earlier from, you know, stolen gens to incarceration, to deaths in custody, to youth suicide, um, you know, we've got a, a whole range of really critical issues going on in our communities that these, these community leaders and elders are right in the middle of. So if you, if you just turn up and go, oh, you know, I just want to yarn, shoot the breeze, fine, like, they'll probably be busy, they'll be too busy. Um, so, you know, whereas if, if you sort of turn up and say, look, would we be able to have a yarn? You know, this is, this is where I work, or these are the resources I, I potentially have access to, or these are the, the, the in lieu or in practice kind of things I could potentially, you know, I'd love to have a chat to you to see how we might be able to support what you're doing. Because in all of this, you've got to remember that self-determination is the key. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, you know, any sort of engagement needs to be sort of based around supporting and, and helping and standing in solidarity with the community, not, for example, turning up and going, oh, we think you need this, here, have this, because um, often that's not what the community actually needs. So you need to talk. Anyway, the next one is how long are you willing to commit to an engagement process? So, we, you know, are you thinking you'll do this for a week, a month or a year or longer? Um, because if, if you're willing to commit for a week or a month, I can guarantee you your end result of engagement's not going to be huge. Um, you might not even actually end up having a decent conversation uh, for any longer than five minutes. If you're looking at committing for a year or longer, that's enough time to actually get to know people, to build trust relationships for, for the community and for the leaders and elders to, to watch you and see how you act and to give you a chance to prove yourself basically, like, have you got the stamina? Are you in this for the long haul? Are you serious? Do you, do you live up to your, what you say you're going to do? Okay. Cause I can assure you that Aboriginal communities and, and groups have, you know, we're used to people making promises that never happen. In fact, it's almost the default. So um, one of the things I say to people is, you know, and, and my approach has always been under promise and over deliver. Like, do not raise expectations if you don't know that you can meet them. Because if you raise expectations and then those expectations, you know, you don't live up to them, the next time you turn up and say, no, 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 but really, I can, they're going to go, go away. Yeah, like, don't bother. Like, we, we, we've been down that tr track before. Yeah, whereas if, for example, someone says, we really need this, whatever this is, and you say, look, I can't promise you, but I'll have a go. You know, I, I really can't promise. I might not be able to do it, but I'll, I'll have a go. And you somehow manage to pull that off and you go, you turn up a week or a year later and go, I did it. Here, here it is. They'll be, they'll be, it'll be, oh, that's awesome. Thank you. You know, like that's fantastic. Whereas if you go, no, 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 I can do that. Not a problem. And then you turn up however long later and go, oh, by the way, I couldn't do that. You know, you're just letting people down. So always under promise, over deliver. And in fact, what you'll find for the most part is that, um, Blackfellas really appreciate honesty. You know, we're, we're reasonable people. We've been around. We know how things work. Like if you can't do it, just say you can't do it. Or if you think it's going to be really hard to achieve, just tell us that. Um, we, we tend to respect people that are honest with us than people that we know are sort of peeing in our pocket a little bit, so to speak. So just be honest um, and be straight up. Um, the last one, what are the consequences if I fail to engage in my efforts to engage? So you've got to think about like, and again, it's related to the under promise of, you know, over deliver. If, if you go into a community and this engagement process and you're promising people things and, you know, and then all of a sudden you can't deliver, well, chances are your reputation in that community is going to sort of suffer a bit of a beating. Um, and the next time you want to engage, you might not be welcome. So just think about, you know, are you ready to engage? Like, have you, have you thought about all these questions? Have you thought about, you know, how long you can do it, what you want to achieve, what you can contribute um, and what are the consequences if you fail? Have you thought about all that stuff and you're ready? Because um, the, first, the first sort of, I suppose, when anyone says to me, you know, I want to engage, it's like, well, how much do you know? Like, how much learning have you done? And if they sort of say, I know a little bit about this and about that, I say, well, you need to do more learning because the first part, you know, and the most important part is that when you go and engage with Aboriginal communities, you need to understand what the issues and the perspectives and the approaches are that you're likely to come across. Because 
you know, if you don't understand what stolen gens are and you don't in, understand what Black Lives Matter and deaths in custody is about, and you don't understand what, what dispossession's about and the impacts it's had, and if you don't understand about the impacts of colonisation and you're not prepared to acknowledge those things, engagement's going to be really hard because, you know, particularly like from not just from a church point of view, but if you're, you know, if you're with a government agency or a church or um, those sorts of things, you know, certainly from a church point of view, we know churches have done some horrible things in the past. So you need to understand that history so that when you turn up and go, hi, I'm, I'm from the Uniting Church and someone goes, rah, 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 go away. You know where that's coming from. It's not personal. It's not a personal attack on you. It's just a, a gut reaction because the church has this place in history where it's done some really horrible things. So you need to be able to actually work through that. Um, and it could be just a matter of saying, look, I completely, I understand, you know, I'm really, really sorry. Look, if all I can do is just apologize, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll pop back another time. Or, you know, you might find with that sort of approach that the person says, well, hang on a minute, who are you? What do you want? You know, um, whereas if you, if you dig your heels in and say, no, 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 that was the church you know, last week or last decade, it's not, we, we're not like that. If you if you sort of have that argy-bargy and want to dig your heels in and try and defend, um, yeah, a lot of Aboriginal people will, will, will come to the party and will give you an argument back. And that sort of argument and confrontation or conflict is not conducive to a long-term relationship. So the best thing you can do is to basically sort of say, look, I'm really sorry, completely understand. So if you know that history, and if you have empathy and compassion, which I'll get to in a sec, but um, yeah, that will really help you with your engagement. I'll keep going because I'm talking. Um, so these are the things you've got to do if you want to be ready. Do your own self-directed learning about Aboriginal perspectives on Australian history. Um, you, someone I know said, um, Google doesn't judge. So just remember that Google doesn't judge. You can, in your own lounge room with no one around, you can Google anything you want and no one will know you're doing it, unless they look at your, your history, but anyway. Um, so you can Google you know, Aboriginal stolen generations, Aboriginal deaths in custody, Aboriginal, and you'll find a wealth of information. So it's, it's all there. Um, you can do a lot of self-directed learning. Um, invest time on a regular basis to meet with the Aboriginal community members and attend relevant community events for at least 12 months. Um, so that could be NAIDOC things, um, National Reconciliation Week, there might be community events, there might be protest marches or rallies, you know, talk to the organisers if you know them or talk to someone and say, do you mind if we come along and stand in solidarity with you? Listen deeply to the views and perspectives of Aboriginal community members. Critical, listen. Never turn up thinking you know it all and thinking you know what the answers are. Listen first and then contemplate and discern and, and reflect and listen a bit more and then eventually get to a place where you're ready to go, all right, you know, now I think I might know how I might be able to help. What do you think? Um, support the aspirations and related needs of the Aboriginal community as best you can through providing whatever assistance you can. Um, and I've said to people, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, this community, they need this. When in fact, what that community might need is, you know, they might have a young kid's sporting team that's been invited to participate in a state competition or a national competition or an international competition. And they might need gear, they might need boots or help with travel to get those kids to that place, you know? And for example, if it's, you know, international or international competition, but those experiences for that group of young kids can be life-changing, you know? So a little bit of fundraising for that little group to, to help get those young people out of their community to see some of the world and experience some stuff, that could be a, you know, an amazing thing. So don't, don't assume you know what, what the best things might be or what the community might be. They will, they will tell you. Um, and the last one, stand in solidarity with the community on issues such as the call for a treaty, stopping Aboriginal deaths in custody and issues relating to land rights. Um, last things, relationship management. Um, be prepared to work at building trust relationships. They can take a really long time to build and can be easily damaged. You know, it can take you a year, two years, long time to get people to trust you, to get to know you. And, you know, if you're in a small group, like, for example, if you're a congregation and two or three people have been working with this particular community and they're doing really great, and things are going really well. And then you get some sort of rogue member of a community that comes into a meeting and says some silly things, you know, maybe some racist things or some ignorant things. 
um, that can be really damaging. So you've got to sort of manage that relationship quite well um, and think about those things. And, you know, if there are certain people that, that are probably not helpful to have in a room for a conversation, manage them out of a room. Don't have them in the room um, because, you know, you need to just understand that, you know, if an Aboriginal elder turns up for a meeting and they feel like they've been disrespected and treated badly, they're probably not going to bother turning up again because, as I said, they've got many, many, many other things on their plate and they've got many demands on their time. So if you get their time, you know, make sure you're very respectful and that they know that, you know, they feel that they're being respected. Um, consistency in representation. Oh, so this one's just about, I would always recommend rather than doing sort of engagement one out with a community, try and have two or three people involved in that relationship with the community. So that if someone, for example, has to move to another state or somewhere else and, um, you know, if it's because if you've got one person that's doing the engagement and they have to relocate into state, for example, you've lost your connection. If you've got two or three people and one person has to go, you've still got one or two people there that can keep that relationship and maybe bring someone else in. Um, so that's helpful. Uh, last things, always be respectful, compassionate and humble in your engagement. Humility will get you a long way. Um, always respect the right of Aboriginal people and communities to self-determine their affairs. And I was mentioning, you know, self-determination is actually a fundamental human right of all First Peoples. It's one of those United Nations rights. Um, if you make a mistake or you're sorry, uh, are taken to task by an elder or a community leader, apologise promptly and in a, and in a genuine way. Uh, saying sorry and meaning it will go a long way to keep relationships intact. Um, even if you don't quite think that you said anything wrong, I, I can assure you that if, you know, I, I've been pulled up, I've had people with fingers in my chest saying, you just said this. And I think, oh, in my head, I think, no, I didn't really say that. But I just say, Look, I'm really, really sorry. Like, if, if, if I said that, I'm really sorry. Like, I, do, I didn't mean to offend anyone. Um, hopefully, you know, let, you know this, is, this is maybe what I meant or, you yeah, know, but... Don't certainly don't try and defend yourself and say, oh, I didn't say that. Um, just say sorry. Just say sorry. Look, I'll do what I need to do to fix this. Um, the relationship is what's important, not what I think. Or you know, don't worry about me. I'm just a, I'm just silly. So yeah, backpedal. Say sorry. Um, it'll go a long way. And remember that there may be wariness, scepticism, or even initial anger or frustration from the community. Remember that there is often a legitimate historical basis for these feelings. Acknowledging these feelings and appropriately expressing your understanding of the legitimacy of these feelings can really help break down barriers. Um, and lastly, remember that building trust takes time. Be patient, be resilient, be flexible, and just be around. Because as I said, people in the community, if you're around, they will watch you, they will you know, check you out, they will see that you keep turning up, they'll realise that you're there for the right reasons, not just, you're not just a flash in the pan there for a photo opportunity, they'll realise that you're serious and you'll eventually get traction. So, and I'm pretty sure that's the end, yes. So thank you for listening and hopefully we've still got a little, oh, we're right on time, but <laughs> I'm happy to hang around for a little bit longer, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. That's um, some fabulous insights there. Um, because we did start late because of my um, stuff up with the connection with the link, we, I would hope that um, people don't mind staying a little longer to have that opportunity for further questions. Um, but can I say at this point, thank you very, very much for sharing your wisdom and your um, your reflections with us. It's been um, a very stimulating and, and conversation and, and important one to have.